West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Understanding the unpredictable nature of the characters involved here, what can we expect from Steve Bannon's court appearance tomorrow? Putting it, Alicia, it's entirely unpredictable. Typically here we expect that the government may arraign Bannon on the charges and there may be some uh, form of hearing over detention. It's not clear yet whether the government will seek to detain Bannon. That would be a heavy lift, but they may decide to argue that given his past history, he's something of a flight risk. Seems highly doubtful to me that a judge would detain him on this misdemeanor charge. Congressman Jimmy Raskin says the January 6th committee may use civil contempt charges to force Bannon to testify. How would that work, Joyce? Uh, so it would work about the same way that what we've seen with Bannon would work, with one big difference. Because Meadows was in the White House at the time of these events, he has a somewhat better claim to executive privilege. But I thought the congressman said something very important in his statement. He pointed out that Meadows completely ignored the dictates of the subpoena, mm -hmm. which you don't get to do. Even if you're going to exert privilege, you have to show up. You have to produce documents or provide a privilege log detailing what you're withholding. You have to answer questions because privilege isn't the answer to every question. When you're asked your name, the, the answer isn't executive privilege. And so you're obligated to go through the questions responding specifically. It's that total flagrant um, effort to avoid the subpoena that led to Bannon's indictment. It will be interesting to see mm. how DOJ will assess the Meadows situation. I do want to loop back to us to the Meadows situation. But first, Carol, we have another clip from that Trump interview showing he is still bitter about what Mike Pence did for the country on January 6th. Take a listen. If Pence did what you wanted, you think you would still be in the White House? I think we would have won, yeah. Can you ever forgive him for that? Uh, I don't know, because uh, um, I picked him. I like him. I still like him, uh, but I don't know that I can forgive him. Carol, how does that square with your own reporting about Trump and Pence's relationship? It squares quite nicely um, and quite sort of shockingly in the sense that, mm. you know, keep in mind that the vice president was nothing but loyal to Donald Trump. Some people compared him to a statue who sat um, nobly or blindly by the president's shoulder for three plus years, nodding and approving of many things that were questionable, sometimes legally dubious, and sometimes just improper for an executive and a commander in chief. And what happened at the end of the day was Pence really wanted to help Donald Trump. He wanted to do what Donald Trump wished, but the Constitution gave him no room for it. Multiple people told me and Phil Rucker, my colleague, partner on a book that we wrote about Donald Trump's final year, they told us that Pence was willing to try to find a way and everywhere he turned, 
constitutional scholars who were stalwarts and stars in the Republican Party told him it's not possible. Everyone from, you know, uh, a important appellate court judge who was a Supreme, a Supreme Court justice nominee to Dan Quayle, um, sort of his mentor, said it, you can't do this. The certification is your job. This is the part of the election and you can't change the rules because Donald Trump wants you to. Ryan, it strikes me, Republican Congressman Anthony Gonzalez, we heard a little bit from him at the top, shared this warning about Trump's plans for 2024. Take a listen. He has evaluated what went wrong on January 6th. Why is it that he wasn't able to steal the election? Who stood in his way? He's going systematically through the country and trying to remove those people and install people who are going to do exactly what he wants them to do, who believe the big lie, who will go along with anything he says. So, Ryan, we have heard this argument before. You've written that Brad Raffensperger is doomed, for example, for standing in Trump's way last time. How do you see this reshaping the party? Yeah, I mean, it's a really big thing. This idea that they're going to replace and kick out of the party people who go against Trump here is really dangerous for a Democratic Republic going forward. If you have that situation where people cannot honestly do their jobs and and accurately reflect the count and are going to lose their their jobs and lose uh, the uh, their future elections because they went against Trump, that's a really scary place we're in. And I think, you know, more broadly, if you look at just all the threats that elections officials have faced after this, Reuters has done some great reporting on this recently about all these threats that were coming into uh, elections officials. And and that's what you see in all these January 6th cases, is you have a bunch of people who honestly believe that the election was stolen. And this was, you know, in their minds, and I think in Trump mind, in Trump's mind, as we saw in that interview, a justifiable response to what they saw as a stolen election. And, you know, if they thought this was 1776 2.0, that's not going to go over too smoothly. They're going to actually do something about it. You know, 1776 wasn't a nonviolent event. And I think that that's what we saw these people doing on January 6th. You know, Carol, you look at this committee, they have issued about three dozen subpoenas and you bring up the graphic, you look at all of those names. Are there names, are there people who you still expect to end up on that list to be issued a subpoena? I can't say with great surety, but based on the reporting that we've done, you can almost automatically expect there will be more. I don't like to report things before we report them, yeah. but I think you will be able to expect uh, quite a few more. And I'd add one more thing that sort of hints a little bit at some of the points you're trying to raise. The committee is smartly increasing their odds to get the facts. They obviously have quite a few facts already that are known, that are documented. They have already 150 people they've interviewed and spoken with and received material from. So they've got a lot of facts and answers, some of which they want to corroborate, some of which they want to paint and describe in more detail and flesh out. You increase your odds when you have people like Mark Meadows and Steve Bannon saying, okay, we're not cooperating, or or Jeff Clark at the Department of Justice, the person who, because he blindly agreed he would dispute the completely fair election in Georgia, the president wanted to make him the new attorney general. These people are not cooperating, but guess who's being subpoenaed now? People who worked for all of those individuals in administrative roles, in deputy roles, in taking notes roles. And that increases the odds of getting the words of those individuals if you can't get them directly Mm. from those people. Joyce, looping back to Bannon, if you are Mark Meadows' attorney, is Bannon's indictment changing the advice that you're giving to your client? Well, it has to change the advice, because if you read the language DOJ used to indict Bannon, it's clear that they're contemplating that it's not just the fact that Bannon was out of the White House for three years that made him so susceptible to indictment. It's also this fact that he did absolutely nothing to comply with the subpoena. As long as Meadows is in that same category, his lawyers have to be concerned that he'll face the same treatment. It is Monday, the 15th of November of 2021, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef, and our daily special is River City Hash Mondays. Yes, we made it to Monday. (laughs) Yes, we did. Well, today is the day Bannon is supposed to give himself up. 
Now, I don't really remember George Floyd giving the option to, you know, hey, you just show up and uh, on Monday and we'll, uh, we'll process you then. I don't remember that. I don't remember a lot of stuff happening to other people that are afforded to these, well, traitors. What are they? They certainly aren't uh, behaving in the best interests of America, while at the same time saying they are doing it for America. No, they're doing it to America, but they're not doing it for America. That's the Nazi mindset. I know. Maybe I'm just being too aggressive with the Nazi label, but I, look, they got the playbook. They're acting like them. And until we can come up with a better word, because American Taliban doesn't quite have the same sort of, well, shall we say, uh, pointed impact as the simple word Nazi. Rolls off the tongue. Actually explains exactly what they are doing. Right on down to the way that they're strong-arming their way into taking over local governments and school boards. Hell, they want, they're going to take over the dog catcher position. We're already trying to get rid of an assessor. We don't like the way he assesses. Well, he did make a mistake here in the county, but what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, well, shit happens. Anyway... Uh, we made it to Monday. Lots of stuff happened in the world over the weekend. And now it's in the past. We got a whole week ahead of us. Bannon hopefully will be showing up. I, I, I actually don't know what time. Has he already made his show? Once I put myself in the bubble, I can't take any more information in because I just, how am I able to do the show, the curated part of the show? You have a lot to choose from from what's already happened. Uh, we're not, uh, quick on our feet like Rachel, able to have a crew put out the copy as it happens. Well, maybe one day. Anyway, um, hopefully he'll be surrendering to authorities in the proper fashion. I think it's going to be, he, it could be one of those, uh, Roger Stone type spectacles. Is he going to get all dressed up? Will he shave this time? Is he going to go out there looking like his disheveled self? Hell, if they take him to Rikers, they got to clean him up so he doesn't pollute Rikers any more than Rikers has already polluted. In fact, I think they should just take him to Rikers. And then we can forget that he's there. Just, where's Steve Bannon? I don't know. Went to Rikers. Okay, can we find him? I don't know. It might take a while. And then maybe he might wise up, or maybe he won't. Now, he's going to use this whole event as another part of his plan. He wants to be the martyr, I guess. Well, it's part of the grift. We already see that there's a different kind of justice for these. What do we, what do we call them? I think we have to call them Nazis. They somehow got imbued with the enabling acts from oh so long ago. Brought it right here to America. Well, I got to tell you, you know, we've been fighting the Hessians for a long time in the United States of America. Yep. Oh, which reminds me. Now, I don't know if it was a bot or a troll, but I got a little hammered and I reported this entity on Twitter who started going off about Jewish supremacy and, you know, you Jew and they, yeah, it's just bullshit. You know, it's the typical anti-Semitic bullshit. And, um, uh, I'm trying to remember if it was, it, it somehow got into my timeline because of someone I follow or follows me who had liked or RT something I said. And then this, entity shows up. Now, I got to tell you, it's a tad concerning because it was so virulent in its anti-Semitic uh, thrust. So, of course, I reported it. I didn't hear anything back from Twitter saying, oh, thank you for helping us root out anti-Semitism. 
I'm afraid I'm going to get something that will say, oh, well, you know, it doesn't really violate our terms of use. Really? The term kike is not a violation of your terms of use? Anyway, this uh, entity came into my timeline because of my use of the term Nazi. And then what do they do? What do Nazis do? They start talking about how Jewish supremacy is the evil of all world. We have to root it out. Baby eaters. Okay. Well, sounds like they want a pogrom or worse. And I'm, I got to tell you, I'm opting for the worst part because, you know, these people are virulent haters. How dare they? Anyway, this idiot, uh, whatever it is, troll or a bot. After a while, I was starting to think maybe it's a bot. But anyway, called me a Bolshevik. How dare you? <laughs> As I had to state, because I like doing this, you know, not, not everybody gets lucky in their birth. <laughs> not everybody. But anyway, I'm the direct descendant of Israel Putnam, who is second in command of George Washington and the Continental Army. Now, I didn't put this in the tweet because it takes up too many characters, but he's the fellow who coined the term don't shoot until you see the whites of their eyes. And everybody think it was, thinks it was on Bunker Hill. No, it was on Breed's Hill. It's the other hill right over there. Not Bunker. Breed's Hill. So, I have a little investment in the United States of America, the great experiment in representative democracy. We are Americans. I count myself as a red-blooded American. And being such, we kick Nazi and commie ass. Don't call me a commie, you Nazi. I'm an American. Just don't rile us up. You won't like it. I'm serious. Jesus. Talk about getting hulked up. We'll show you what hulking up's all about. Jeez. Okay. Well, um, our mission in life here at Netroots Radio, and I don't know, maybe as a, a, a species, is to fight fascism and Nazism. Okay. I know there are some of our neighbors, and they seem really nice, too. Good Republicans. Yeah, they're good Germans of old. And if you don't know what a good German is, they weren't so good. Okay? I think they would have been the literal definition of sheeple. Just went along to get along. Oh, people getting sent away on train cars? Well, hey... That's just the price of freedom. <laughs> yeah, isn't it? Uh, babies dying of the flu and exposure on concrete floors and icebox baby gulags. Oh, well, I don't know. They shouldn't have been here anyway. I, you know, evil. And they were asylum seekers. Ah, you know. Okay. I read also an article where American evangelicals are going to just drop the whole Jesus story of, you know, helping thy neighbor. Okay. Now, when I talk about we got to punch the Nazis. The reason I say that is because <laughs> of like what these American evangelicals are talking about. It's not about love thy neighbor, helping thy neighbor. It's, you know, making sure that your neighbor doesn't uh, intrude upon your belief system. And if they do, well, you got to get rid of them permanently, like in a final solution. That's why I call them Nazis. Arbeit macht frei. <laughs> I, they even throw that stuff around with no sense of irony. Work will make you free. Oh, really? So what do you have in mind? Something worse than Icebox Baby Gulags, maybe? Yeah, they don't have to worry about the Icebox Baby Gulags. They already have all sorts of abandoned uh, mega super malls. How's people there while they're processing them? Out of this life. It'll be quick. 
Because, you know, if there's anything about uh, the Nazis, they like efficiency. I don't know about this crew, though. They can't. I, I don't know. If you're going to have a Mussolini, you got to have a Mussolini that can make the trains, supply trains run on time. Not happening. Anyway, it uh, seems like there are grave forces arrayed against the United States of America, and they happen to be from within. And uh, the sooner that we accept that fact, and I know that everybody here that listens to us on Networks Radio already has. I'm just being rhetorical. But the sooner that we accept that as a nation, oh boy, is that civil war then? No, we just don't let those people participate in proper society, okay? You don't get to be on the soccer team. Oh, you're going to punish my kid? Well, yeah. You know, got to change you somehow. Well, then I'm reading stories about these little kids. I don't know who their parents were, the ones we were just speaking about, who dress up in KKK hoods on Halloween and then went around and beaten up children of color. What the hell? All right. And Rittenhouse is such an innocent little boy. He had a little tete-a-tete with some of the, uh, well, I call them Nazi sympathizers. At least that's what they are. On the town Facebook page, who considered him to be such an innocent little boy, he had to kill those people. who he, they, they were going to kill him. They were. They yelled, we're going to kill you. Have you ever been, have you ever had anybody yell at you? They're going to kill you. He had to shoot him. Well, you know what? If somebody yells at you that they're going to kill you and throws a plastic bag of nothing at you, maybe you shouldn't be having a gun. Give me a break. I'm going to kill you. Like, that's going to cause me to be so fearful of my life that I have to take another life. Jesus. I got to tell you, if people are going to kill you, they don't announce it first. All right? And that's why you shouldn't have a gun, because you're obviously not experienced enough to know that simple fact. Jeez. I don't know. This is the, these are the kinds of Nazis we have to put up with today. They're dimwits. I know we can sit around and wonder, why the hell are we losing to that? How is it that they are able to take over? Because I'll tell you why. We are loath to punch the Nazi. Have a Polish war hero from way back, resistance, in World War II, who stood 90, I think 94, maybe a bit older, stood up to the Nazis in Poland uh, over the weekend, called them bastards. Shut up a little boy, you bastards. That's punching the Nazi. Okay? Jab here, little jab here, and then a roundhouse right up the noggin. Okay? Oh, boy. Well, we better get to work. Here, at least uh, on this Monday, <laughs> River City Ash Mondays, and in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and of course, at the top, that was a breakdown of Bannon, and a lot more about the January 6th committee and its uh, task ahead. On the rest of the menu, as many as 160,000 active duty military members are having trouble feeding their families. Hmm. A hotbed of abuse, graft, and corruption during the Trump administration. Hundreds of Bureau of Prison Workers continue to commit crimes. And conservative U.S. bishops ignore the Pope and persist denouncing President Joe Biden. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where Spain summoned the Cuban envoy in Madrid after Spanish media credentials were revoked in Havana. And thick smog is choking the Indian capital, New Delhi, as air pollution levels soar to lethal concentrations. All that and more 
on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, to the right of the page is the chat room link. Hey, does that sound French to you? <laughs> I guess it does to some right wingers who think, uh, you know, they want to, well, be a little racist and misogynist at the same time. I guess it's called miso- misogynoir. Yes, they are. Anyway, uh, that our chat room link is right there at the right of the page, near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. And Kelly Lincoln monitors that chat room, so take part. Thank you. And thank you, Kelly. If you take a gander, yeah, we we talk like that around here. If you would uh, look across the page to the left, near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, there is the link to our Patreon site. And yes, we need money to pay our bills. Um... I just got the offer from uh, where we post our podcasts to uh, now that apparently the introductory offer that we were under, I had no idea it was an introductory offer, but apparently it was, (laughs) and that was a while ago too, years. Well, apparently they've discontinued it, and uh, I guess we're going to have to get bumped up into quite expensive uh, uh, level to continue the level of service that we provide here at Netroots Radio, indeed. So, with that stated, if you could afford an espresso-type coffee drink, and if you could send those funds our way once a month, it really helps us defray the the ever-increasing costs of running this powerhouse of resistance against, well, the hostile takeover of the United States of America. And we found that as long as we pay our bills, we somehow are still able to fly under the radar and continue that resistance and fulfill our civic duty as the founders originally intended oh so many years ago. All kidding aside, thank you for your generosity and thank you in advance for your potential generosity in the future. Indeed, thank you. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. And thank you, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. Incidentally, I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime, and they get that posted up on Twitter and other social media platforms. So follow me there on Twitter at Justice Putnam, and you can get those show notes and links, which are integral parts to this whole well, multimedia operation we call West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Uh huh. You can follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. And you can pick up those podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., etc., etc. All right. When I say post our podcasts, that's also storing them. So we may be splitting up how we store our podcasts because we have uh, quite a quite an archive of all the different shows that we've had over the years and continue to this very day. So check it all out. We're here. <laughs> okay, this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Sounds French, doesn't it? is by Ashraf Khalil from the Associated Press. It's a hidden crisis that has existed for years inside one of the most well-funded institutions on the planet and has only worsened during the coronavirus pandemic. As many as 160,000 active-duty military members are having trouble feeding their families. 
That estimate by Feeding America, which coordinates the work of more than 200 food banks around the country, underscores how long-term food insecurity has extended into every aspect of American life, including the military. The exact scope of the problem is a topic of debate due to a lack of formal study. I wonder why that is. But activists say it has existed for years and primarily affects junior-level enlisted service members, ranks E1 to E4 in military parlance with children. It's a shocking truth that's known to many food banks across the U.S., said Vince Hall, Feeding America's government relations officer. This should be the cause of deep embarrassment. Well, yeah, it already is. The group estimates that or estimates that 29% of troops in the most junior enlisted ranks faced food insecurity during the previous year. It is what it is, said James Bonahan, uh, or Bonanen, age 34, a naval E-4 petty officer, third class, in San Diego, who relies on food assistance to keep his two daughters fed. You know what you're signing up for in the military, he said, after emerging from a drive through food distribution organized by the local armed services YMCA branch. But I'm not going to lie. It's really tough, he admitted. In addition to modest pay for junior enlisted ranks, the frequent moves inherent to military life make it difficult for military spouses to find steady work. Also, the internal military culture of self-sufficiency leaves many reluctant to speak about their difficulties for fear they will be regarded as irresponsible. Really? Is that only endemic to military life? Hmm. The problem is exacerbated by an obscure agriculture department rule that prevents prevents thousands of needy military families from accessing the SNAP government assistance program, commonly known as food stamps. It's one of these things that the American people don't know about, but it's a matter of course among military members. We know this, said Senator Tammy Duckworth, an Illinois Democrat and former Black Hawk pilot who lost both legs in a helicopter crash in Iraq. We're the mightiest military on the face of the earth, and yet those who are on the lower rung of our military ranks are, if they are married, have a child or two, they're hungry. How can you focus on carrying out the mission and defending our democracy if you're worried about whether or not your kid gets dinner tonight? Perhaps the best indication of how entrenched the problem has become is that a robust Network of military-adjacent charitable organizations such as the Armed Services YMCA and Blue Star Families has developed an infrastructure of food banks near most major domestic bases. San Diego may be one of the epicenters of the phenomenon, with high housing costs and multiple military bases within driving distance for Brooklyn Pittman, whose husband Matthew is in the Navy, the move to California from West Virginia this year was a financial shock. We had a nice savings built up, and then we moved out here, and it was rough, she said. We still had student loans and everything on top of everything else. Their savings quickly disappeared, and the small income she earns from dog sitting didn't, did not even come close to covering the shortfall. For a while, the couple considered sleeping in their car on the base grounds until the next paycheck. Pittman was one of 320 families participating in the Armed Services YMCA's late October drive through food distribution. The organization has been housing events like this for more than 10 years, but when the pandemic struck, expanded operations from six sites uh, to 11 around the country, and they doubled the frequency of the San Diego area events. There's a diversity of opinion as to how much of a stigma the issue carries within military communities. One of the strangest aspects of the problem is a mysterious agriculture department regulation that prevents thousands of needy military families from receiving food stamps. Families living outside the base grounds receive a basic allowance for housing to help co cover most of their costs. 
But the 2008 Food and Nutrition Act dictates that the allowance counts as income in calculating eligibility to receive SNAP benefits. And that ends up disqualifying thousands of military families. The allowance does not count as income for tax reasons or for WIC benefits. Food security activists say they're confused by both the original rule and the fact that it has endured for more than 12 years. No one seems to know why it's still a law, said Hall, the Feeding America official. Michael Basamo and Michael R. Sisak of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays. More than 100 federal prison workers have been arrested, convicted, or sentenced for crime since the start of 2019, including a warden indicted for sexual abuse, an associate warden charged with murder, Guards taking cash to smuggle drugs and weapons and supervisors stealing property such as tires and tractors. An AP investigation has found that the Federal Bureau of Prisons, with an annual budget of nearly $8 billion, is a hotbed of abuse, graft, and corruption, and has turned a blind eye to employees accused of misconduct. In some cases, the agency has failed to suspend officers who themselves had been arrested for crimes. Two-thirds of the criminal cases against Justice Department personnel in recent years have involved federal prison workers who account for less than one-third of the department's workforce. Of the 41 arrests this year, 28 were Bureau of Prison employees or contractors. The FBI had just five. DEA and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives each had two. The numbers highlight how criminal behavior by employees festers inside a federal prison system meant to punish and rehabilitate Are they really rehabilitating people? Well, it says so in this article. Rehabilitate people who have committed bad acts. The revelations come as advocates are pushing the Biden administration to get serious about fixing the Bureau. In one case, unearthed by the AP, the agency allowed an official at a federal prison in Mississippi whose job it was to investigate misconduct of other staff members to remain in his position after he was arrested on charges of stalking and harassing fellow employees. The official was also allowed to continue investigating a staff member who had accused him of a crime. In a statement to the AP, the Justice Department said it will not tolerate staff misconduct, particularly criminal misconduct. The department said it is committed to holding accountable any employee who abuses a position of trust, which we have demonstrated through federal criminal prosecutions and other means. Attorney General Merrick Garland has said his deputy, Lisa Monaco, meets regularly with Bureau of Prisons officials to address issues plaguing the agency. Federal prison workers in nearly every job have been charged with crimes... Those employees include a teacher who pleaded guilty in January to fudging an inmate's high school equivalency and a chaplain who admitted taking at least $12,000 in bribes to smuggle Suboxone, which is used to treat opioid addiction as well as pot, tobacco, and cell phones and leaving the items in a prison chapel cabinet for inmates to retrieve. At the highest ranks... The warden of a federal women's prison in Dublin, California, was arrested in September and indicted this month on charges he molested an inmate multiple times, 
scheduled times where he demanded she undress in front of him and amassed a slew of nude photos of her on his government-issued phone. Warden Ray Garcia, who was placed on administrative leave after the FBI raided his office in July, allegedly told the woman there was no point in reporting the sexual assaults because he was close friends with a person who would investigate the allegation and that the inmate would not be able to ruin him. Garcia has pleaded not guilty. David Crary of the Associated Press brings us this last offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. While some U.S. Catholic bishops continue to denounce President Joe Biden for his support of legal abortion, their conference as a whole is likely to avoid direct criticism of him at his upcoming national meeting. The highest profile agenda item is a proposed teaching document about the Sacrament of Communion. Months of work on the document by the conference's Committee on Doctrine coincided with sometimes heated debate among the bishops as to whether Biden and other Catholic politicians who support abortion rights are unworthy of receiving communion. The draft of the document, circulating ahead of the November 15-18 meeting in Baltimore, breaks little new ground, though its language could be toughened during the gathering. The draft mentions abortion only once and does not name Biden or other politicians, though it says at one point, lay people who exercise some form of public authority have a special responsibility to embody church teaching. A member of the Doctrine Committee, Bishop Michael Olson of Fort Worth, Texas, said he and his colleagues decided that the document should avoid any trace of partisan politics, yet Olson remains an outspoken critic of Biden's abortion stance, saying the president has upped the scale of the scandal. He's gone on record as saying abortion is a fundamental right, while presenting himself as an exemplary Catholic, Olson told the AP. The issue of public confusion is really at stake here, Olson said without any sense of irony. In this reporter's opinion... While some bishops have made clear that they would deny communion to Biden, there is no national policy on the matter. Cardinal Wilton Gregory, the Archbishop of Washington, has affirmed that Biden is welcome to receive communion there. Last month, after a private meeting with Pope Francis at the Vatican, Biden said the subject of abortion was not raised, but indicated he had the pontiff's general support. Well, that brings us to our break. And when we get back from our break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, style over substance. 
Wes Anderson films have a certain tried and true formula that works. Not only do they look a certain way, but Anderson uses a select crew of actors to get what he's trying to do. What has made his films enjoyable are the iconic set designs and unique storylines. In his latest, The French Press, the set designs are there, as are Bill Murray, Edward Norton, Tilda Swinton, and others, but the storylines seem a bit disjointed and the results tend to fall flat. It's the tale of a Midwestern expat in France who starts a magazine influenced by, if not plagiarized from, the Paris Review. It's not a spoiler to reveal that the founder dies with his will calling for the cessation of publication. The film is actually three vignettes based on articles from the final issue, which blend dark humor, the sublime, and even a touch of action, and vary from just okay to somewhat engaging. Arguably, the most interesting is the third one, featuring Jeffrey Wright as a James Baldwin-type character who, like Baldwin, is gay, black, and an expat living in France. That one even features an appearance on a 70s talk show, a preferred format for Baldwin. However, rather than delving much into this character, this one transforms from a story about a chef into one involving the kidnapping of a police chief's child, including some animation that seems gratuitous. The A-list crew all shine with what they're given here. The problem is that there's not enough dimension given to any of the characters to feel anything about them. The French press is a well-made, aesthetically pleasing watch, but the end result is a bit like a beautifully wrapped box with a generic gift card inside. The differences between this one and, say, Moonrise Kingdom are real characters in a storyline you'll remember. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. YouTube. This is Scientific American 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. Just like cows, sheep, and bison roam the earth in herds today, so too did plant eating dinosaurs. And it appears they began flocking together much earlier than we used to think just as the Jurassic period was beginning to unfold. This is really a critical time in the evolution of dinosaurs. This is pretty early on. So the idea is that this type of social behavior may actually contribute to the evolutionary success of dinosaurs. Jahan Ramazani of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology is a geochronologist. In his words, I date things, and I date old things, things in the millions and billions of years, not not the really young stuff. In this case, Ramazani was dating tiny zircon crystals embedded in a fossil bed in Patagonia, near the southern tip of South America. Those crystals dated back to nearly 193 million years ago. And the fossils preserved there, an array of nearly 200 specimens of a plant eater named Musaurus patagonicus, provide a snapshot of a dinosaur at all stages of its life. Eggs and hatchlings, clumps of juveniles, and then further out, adults. So this kind of uh, undisturbed distribution of fossils and this kind of age segregation basically shows that these dinosaurs had had a uh, kind of a social structure. They lived in a colony. And uh, every, everybody has got things to do, duties with respect to the youngs and, and the juveniles. The study in the journal Scientific Reports suggests dinosaurs developed complex social behavior 40 million years earlier than we used to think. And Ramazani says the work also advances long standing questions about the social structure of dinosaurs. Was it more like primitive? Taxa, like the crocodiles, or look like the more evolved types of animals like birds and mammals. And we are beginning to see that, yes, it it looks more like a mammal or more like a bird type colony. Whatever type of social structure it was, the scientists hypothesized that it helped large plant eating dinosaurs first spread across the planet, kickstarting tens of millions of years of dominion on Earth. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetrootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetrootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. (laughs) 
I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1978. That was the day OSHA published its lead standard. The standard reduced the permissible exposure by 75% to protect nearly a million workers from damage to nervous, urinary, and reproductive systems. As early as 1908, Alice Hamilton, the mother of occupational medicine, noted that lead had endangered workers as far back as the first half century after Christ. In their book, Deceit and Denial, The Deadly Politics of Industrial Pollution, Historians Gerald Markowitz and David Rosner add that, throughout her distinguished career, Hamilton was deeply involved in uncovering the relationship between lead and disease in the American workforce. Hamilton's groundbreaking research on the effects of lead paved the way for a growing uproar against its continued use. After the Occupational Safety and Health Act passed in 1970, occupational and public health activists pushed hard for a lead standard. A new generation of industrial hygienists emphasized how unsafe industry-driven conclusions regarding safe lead levels impacted women workers and workers of color. Industry had long asserted that women and African Americans were simply more susceptible to lead poison, which served to justify discrimination in hiring. Some unions accepted these terms, if only to demand a stringent lead standard that included immediate implementation of engineering controls. But leading hygienists like Gene Stellman blasted these arguments. Stellman insisted such conclusions reflected racial and gender bias rather than any credible scientific evidence. She added that men, women, and children, regardless of race or ethnicity, were all adversely affected by lead exposure. The final standard adopted was considered a compromise. Discrimination in hiring has continued and enforcement proves difficult. But even a watered-down standard was too much for the lead industry. They have been fighting it ever since. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 52 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high of only about 58. Uh, Cloudy with rain developing early this afternoon with winds out of the west-southwest at 10 to 15 miles per hour, expecting nearly a quarter inch of rain. Cloudy early tonight with some clearing expected late. Lows in the upper 30s. Winds out of the west at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And abundant sunshine tomorrow with highs around 50. Winds light and variable. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County now stand at 241,003. And our deceased have ticked up once again and now stands at 339. Pollen is rated as none right outside the window in Rogue River proper. The air quality index for the region is good at 22 parts per million, and the daytime UV index is low at level 2. Barometric pressure is falling at 30.02 inches. Visibility is down to 5 miles, and relative humidity is at 97%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 52 and cloudy. Paris is 45 and cloudy. Rome is 66 degrees and sunny. Kiev is 33 and cloudy. Kabul is 42 and clear. Hong Kong is 65 and fair. Tokyo is 55 and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 60 and clear. San Francisco, California is 52 degrees with heavy fog. And New York, New York is 44 degrees Fahrenheit and mostly cloudy. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world.
Barry Hatton of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Spain's foreign minister summoned Cuba's top diplomat in Madrid to explain why Havana revoked the press credentials of five journalists on the island working for Spanish state news agency EFA. The Spanish embassy in Havana is also working with Cuban authorities to ensure the return of the EFA team's credentials, which they need in order to work in Cuba, Spanish diplomatic sources told the AP. EFA said Cuban officials offered no explanation about why or until when they were revoking the credentials of three reporters, a photographer and a cameraman. Later yesterday, amid a diplomatic backlash about the move, Cuban authorities returned credentials to two of the journalists. The Cuban government's measure late Saturday came two days before a planned opposition protest march today in Cuba that the government has outlawed, but that the organizers have urged people to join anyway. Spanish Foreign Minister Jose Manuel Alberes summoned Cuba's charged affair for a meeting first thing today, a Spanish diplomatic source said. Cuba currently has no ambassador in Madrid. The source spoke on condition of anonymity in line with foreign ministry rules. The Federation of Spanish Journalists Association said Cuba's measure was a clear violation of international norms on freedom of the press and urged the Cuban government to reconsider. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes, quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Sheikh Salik of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Sky obscured by thick gray smog, monuments and high-rise buildings swallowed by a blanket of haze, People struggling to breathe. In the Indian capital, it is that time of year again. The city's air quality index fell into the very poor category yesterday, Sunday, according to SAFAR, India's main environmental monitoring agency. And in many areas, levels of the deadly particulate matter ranged or reached about six times the global safety threshold. NASA satellite imagery also showed most of India's northern plains covered by thick haze. Among the many Indian cities gasping for breath, New Delhi tops the list every year. The crisis deepens, particularly in the winter, when the burning of crop residues in neighboring states coincides with cooler temperatures that trap deadly smoke. That smoke travels to New Delhi, leading, leading to a surge of pollution in the city of more than 20 million people and exacerbating what is already a public health crisis. The New Delhi government ordered the closing of schools for a week and construction sites for four days beginning today. Government offices were also told to shift to work from home for a week and to reduce the number of vehicles on the road. The capital's top elected leader said a complete lockdown of the city was likely, but the decision would not would be taken after consultation with federal government. India's pollution problems are not limited to the capital. Emissions from industries with no pollution control technology and coal, which helps produce most of the country's electricity, have been linked to the bad air quality in other urban areas. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up tomorrow for Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. 
So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TF, des photos de bord de mer, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Ton mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Ton mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver